Hey, my name is Sister Michelle Bizayon. My given name, however, is Marie Irene. Um, when we changed our names in, I think it was the early 70s, I chose to keep my religious name because I had a knot in the community by the same name. And we teased each other, I didn't want to be junior. Um, I'm one of eight children, uh, I'm in the middle. Uh, as we were growing up, uh, until I was about nine and a half, we were just five. Then um, my sister was born and a while later my two younger brothers were born. So my youngest brother was born after I was a, when I was a postulant. So the two youngest I didn't really grow up with. Um, my dad was uh, born in Canada, and we have very strong ties to, to Canada. And mom was a Vermonter. She was one of 12. Dad was one of 18. Uh, we, so our family and relationships are very familiar to me. Um, I was born in Waterbury, Connecticut. And uh, we, I lived there all of my life until I came to uh, Putnam with the daughters. I went to school with the daughters, uh, both grammar school and in high school. I came to Putnam Catholic Academy. I was a boarder at, at that time. And I got to know the daughters very well uh, in that, during those years. Um, also, in terms of my vocation, I kind of kiddingly say that um, it was all in the in the in the name. Uh, my mother had an, her oldest sister Irene was a religious in the congregation of Notre Dame, and my father had two sisters, um, sister Irene and sister Laura, who were daughters of the Holy Spirit. So I really grew up with us. Um, and I remember when we were little children, we were up in Canada, they would come on vacation, and we'd always look forward to their coming because we got to wear their coif for a few minutes. So um, for, from an early age, <laughs> I've known the daughters. Um, I think what attracted me, uh, particularly in high school, uh, being a resident at, at PCA, um, you get to see a lot. And the relationship and the rapport of the sisters uh, their sense of simplicity, um, th their prayer time really attracted me to the daughters. Um, I think I began thinking about entering probably in the eighth grade, but kind of put that to the side during high school until I was a senior. Um, and um, I might add they have two other cousins uh, who are daughters of the Holy Spirit. And so I entered in September of 1965. We were, I think, 13 in our group. So again, it was a large group. And I, I just, just grew to love the daughters. Um, in terms of um, Vatican II, um, we entered at the time that we called the turning of the page. They were just beginning to, it was, rewrite the rule of life also at that time in view of the call from Vatican II to do that. I had a very little of the older way of living religious life and more into the, the newer way uh, where we started um, looking at the vows and studying the vows in terms of uh, what the call of our founders and foundresses was. And so the changes affected me somewhat, but not as much, I think, as some of the older sisters because of the fact that I entered at the time that I did. Um, I think some of the hardship for me at that time with the daughters, with any women in religious life, was the fact that many chose to leave the congregation. And for me, that was, I think, the hardest part of uh, the changing. Um, I guess I wondered, you know, why did they leave? You know, what was it that uh, was calling them um, to leave the religious life and follow a different life? And uh, I guess I never completely understood that. But I think as, as years went by, um, I could respect their decisions, you know, that they felt that they needed to do that at that time. Um, and I think since then, I think the flow of religious life is um, very healthy. I think there have been 
a lot of changes in the way that we're living religious life. And I think that that's all for the good. I think we need to be able to follow the times, that the way of living um, in this world is so different. And I think to be able to witness to our people the good news of Jesus, that we need to be able to be in touch with where they're at and what kind of, you know, what are the situations that they're living in. Um, I think that uh, um, it's just a, an exciting time to live. I think that our call today is, to, as Marie Balaven and René Burel, who are the founders of our community, back in 1706, they had a call. The, they answered the needs of the day. They went to visit the sick. They taught the little girls in education. And I think that's what we're called to do, but in a different way today because of the situation of our world. I think the important thing is that we continue that in a spirit of simplicity. And it, the important thing also is to bring the tender love of our God to our people today who are in such, in such need of that. One of the ways that in my own life I have done that is in the nursing career. I was very happy uh, the day after profession when I received my first obedience was to go to nursing school. And I was to leave in two weeks. And um, I, I was really very happy. And I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which again is the source of the roots for our own province. Uh, in 1903, uh, we opened the house in Bridgeport. At the time it was called St. Michael's and it evolved into the Holy Spirit community. And at that time, the sisters, of course, knew very little English, and they were not used to our culture. But the Bishop Turney, who was the one who invited the daughters to come to the United States, um, invited the sisters to go to Bridgeport, among other cities, and particularly to care for the poor, the sick poor. And at that time, he organized in four cities, um, in Bridgeport, Waterbury, Hartford, and New Haven, an organization of what they call charitable women called the Queen's Daughters. And they have been with us right through. They were support for us. They helped to uh, organize the, the new house. They were able to raise funds through bazaars in different ways to help support our ministry to the sick poor. The Queen's Daughters were with us until, I believe it was 2003 or 2004. We continu they continued their presence and the support for us in home care in Bridgeport. And uh, I lived there, like I said, for my three years of nursing school from 68 to 71, and so I got to be familiar a little bit with the work that they, they, they did for us. And then again, um, I left there and returned to Bridgeport on a uh, weekly basis, uh, probably 2003, I think, maybe for a year and a half, when the last of our nursing sisters had to come to Putnam because she retired. But we still had a few patients there. and. Besides the Queen's Daughters, United Way was also a very big support to us. I don't remember exactly what year, but for many years, they helped to fund our ministry there with the sick poor. And so for that year and a half, I went on a weekly basis to visit. I believe I had four to six patients, and I went uh, to their homes, like Sister Teresa and many daughters did, uh, pro helped to take care of their medications, you know, did medical assessments and that kind of thing. I've had very positive experiences in community. Uh, for, when I was in nursing school in Bridgeport, uh, there, was a, two other, there were two other sisters who were also student nurses at the time, and we just had a, it was a good experience. We had, it was at the time when we started experimenting with different styles of prayer, which was very um, good for us. Uh, before it was you know, strictly the office book, but now we were able to be a little bit more creative in our style of prayer. And that was very life-giving for all of us, I believe. Um, and sometimes a little bit challenging also. Um, I think in terms of um, 
recreation. I think that's an important piece, the be able, being able to laugh together and, you know, uh, just have that sense of joy. And we, we experienced that in that community uh, very much so. We even, uh, some of us went out and made snow angels, you know, that used to be unheard of, you know. But um, we just, it was just a good rapport that we had. And also in that community, very often we would have other sisters who came in for a short period of time. And um, that just enhanced our life together. It was very rich. Uh, I think also one, an important piece for that time in Bridgeport was the changing of the habit. Uh, we were one of the first communities uh, to be asked to experiment with secular clothes. Uh, we, at that time, it was still with a veil. But um, we were, you know, it was really kind of an exciting time. And yet, you know, what are the others going to think? <laughs> that kind of thing. But... Um, we did do that because when I first went there in August of 68, uh, we had the, long, the longer white habit. And I remember when the first day that we went to school, back to nursing school with our changed habit, the nursing instructors sighed with relief that we would no longer be carrying germs along the floors and in the hospital. From Bridgeport, I came to the Villa St. Joseph. Uh, where I spent a good part of my nursing uh, life. And there again, community was different. Uh, we had our, the nursing staff formed part of a little community, but then there was also the whole uh, house, which was, we were about 33 to 34 sisters usually there. So we had that hospice piece, supporting and being present to the six sisters. And I think that strengthens a community depending on how you approach that, if it's in a positive way, and, and it was with us. Also, while I was there, we hired the first lay staff uh, for our nursing. And that, again, I think that calls you to witness to lay women who we're all about. And I think that was um, kind of a subtle thing, but it was very real. From there, I moved to a smaller community for a while. I was still working at the villa, um, and we were a group of six or seven. And that was another adjustment for me in terms of community, um, moving from the larger to the smaller again. And I think it was there that I really grew to appreciate community and what that's all about in terms of relationship with one another, um, understanding differences and being able to respect that. And, and um, you know, some people say, how can a group of women live together without fighting? <laughs> it does, we do have disagreements, but I think it's in the attitude and the approach that you have to that that's important. And we did have that um, in that community. From there, I moved to Worcester and um, we lived in a small apartment there were four of us, and we live on a third floor apartment in there. Um, and that was that could be a challenge. You know, you each had your own bedroom, the kitchen and the living room, and you know that that was what we had. And so again, I think it calls you to growth. It calls you to understanding of other people and how they live and to be able to respect that. Then we moved to a house. Um, and again, dynamics change. You know, it's, it's a bigger facility or building. And, um, you know, you look for a little bit of privacy. And I think people really, really respected that a lot. Um, from there, I moved to Hartford, Connecticut. And again, we moved into, or moved into the house, which we've had since 1909. And so there's a lot of history in that house. It kind of vibrates, I think. You know, you feel the... the um, the vibes of the past there. And um, again, I think it's continued growth. I think that's a really um, important thing in terms of community, that you allow yourself to grow and be challenged by other people, by different ways of thinking, by different ways of prayer. And um, again, I, I think the important thing there is to be able to laugh together and, and pray well together. And I believe we really had that experience there. We take three vows of uh, consecrated celibacy, obedience, and poverty. And in poverty, the main piece of that is having things in common. 
that I don't own anything of my for myself. Everything that I have, I share with the sisters. And for example, my paycheck, if I have received a paycheck, I give that to the community. I don't accept it for myself. And it's put in a common fund so that needs of the community are met that way. And whatever we have, um, we share with the people that we, we service, that we minister to. That's very simply put for the vow of poverty. Consecrated celibacy, we choose not to be married, but we choose the celibacy. It's a whole way of living in relationship with one another because our God called us into relationship. The Trinity, the whole foundation of the Trinity is relationship, and it's this call to celibacy that, that we take as women religious um, to witness to that, uh, that we can be in good re relationship with one another, with our God, and with our earth. And I think that's all very important. And in our vow of obedience, again, uh, when, we fr when I first entered, uh, I'll give us an example for, for ministry. Um, they asked me to go to the Villa St. Joseph after I received my diploma for nursing. And and at that time, you met with the provincial, and she said, Sister, I would like you to invite you to go to this ministry. And you could, you know, I think in the older days, you said yes. <laughs> when I came after Vatican II, we were able to, to speak and dialogue with the provincial in terms of, you know, well, maybe, maybe not, that kind of thing. And I think that's the way it is today. Um, it, the important piece is being open to God's call, and that is through either the, the provincial, the, the needs of the province, or maybe I heard about an opening somewhere in nursing, for example, that I felt I would be living the mission of the daughters there, and I could dialogue with the provincial, and then we would, she, we would come to a decision. The important piece is our mission as daughters and the living of our charism, which is to bring the tender love of our God to those whom we serve, those we live with. And that's the, the critical piece for daughters and, and to live in that spirit of Pentecost. God's earth is a gift to us. And in Genesis, God calls us to be stewards I think it's more than being a steward. I think it's being in relationship with earth and the gifts that God has given us in creation. We have to be careful. And I, since 1995, at our provincial chapter, there's been a group of us, and we call our, our committee relationship with creation. We didn't call it just the creation committee. We thought because of our Trinitarian spirituality, if you will, there's always that issue of relationship. And we felt that it was important, even in our title, to bring out this aspect of relationship with. And so we try in our committee to keep the sisters aware and others aware of issues that come up. Uh, for example, right now, the whole issue of water in our, in our, in our world. Um, to bring to consciousness these issues to the sisters through, we've done uh, Earth Days um, almost every year. We prepare something for the province and hopefully spread, they spread that out to their families and friends. Um, we've gone to workshops which have helped us to develop a keener sense of the issues of Earth. And, um, it fits into our, our charism, I believe, because of this whole relationship piece and ownership, um, putting in common from like our vow of poverty calls us to. Justice issues, that's another key piece, I believe, for religious today. I think because of the fact that, for example, our own congregation, we have no schools at this time. We never had hospitals, but we had the home care in many places. I, today's world is in such a, um, uh, has such a need for justice because it's through justice that we acquire peace in our world. 
I was lucky to have been part of, of the original, what we at the time called Social Concerns Committee, which was back in the 70s. And now I belong to the Justice Committee of the province. And we also, I think it's an important piece to remember that the daughters are part of a group of six congregations called the Collaborative Center for Justice, which was um, formed back in the late 90s, I believe, as a call to women religious to be involved with what is going on in, in politics and in the legislature and how that relates to the poor and how we could be more supportive of them. So we are part of six congregations and what the important piece of the collaborative is education of our sisters in terms of issues that come up. Uh, for example, the death penalty uh, here in Connecticut especially, but I know that they're working on it also in California. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate to participate in the rally in Fort Bennings, Georgia of the, for the closing of the School of the Americas. This has been something we've been supporting for many years. And um, the, the gathering is of women religious, priests, lay people from all over the country and even from other countries coming to ask our country to please close this school, which um, forms and trains people for dictatorships and military uh, overtakings and that kind of thing. And so we have, feel very strongly um, as a province to continue to support that movement. At, at the present time, our Justice Committee is working for immigration. We have just developed a corporate stance, which means that we as a province and our associates uh, will support any Legislation, legislation and programs which will be helpful uh, to bring about immigration reform in our country. In terms of governance of our congregation, we are a congregation that was founded in France back in 1706. And at the time we had two women who, made, who professed vows. And as the congregation grew, there had to be a governance put in place and what has has evolved to is that we have what we call our superior general, who is the person who is head of the entire congregation. And she is assisted by a general council of four members. And we are very happy to say that right now we have two Nigerian, two African sisters on our council and a sister from France and a sister from England. And we are the congregation is divided into provinces, or they call them units now. Um, we have, and each unit or province has a leader. We have a provincial in the United States, in France, and in England. And in our southern countries, in Latin America, and in our three countries in Africa, we have, they're called vice provincials. And each of these leaders has to assist her, a council. For example, here in America, we have our provincial and she has two counselors. Something what ha which happens when there are only two counselors with the provincial is what we call an advisory council. And they are named not for decide to make decisions, but as a resource for decisions and um, events that are happening, and we have just named four sisters to this advisory council. So it depends on the number of the, uh, the province or vice provincial as to how many counselors there are and if there's an advisory council also. In terms of having both sisters associates and consecrated seculars, I, I think it's a very important thing today Fewer women are entering religious life, although parenthetically, that seems to be coming back again. It's important that our charism continue to be lived. Our charism is so important to us. 
You know, our call, our gift as daughters is to live in that spirit of Pentecost and to bring the tender love of our God to our world. And as the number of sisters diminishes in the first world countries, you know, in France, in Europe, um, in America, in the United States, we find that it's, we would like to, our charism to continue to live. And it is through our associates, through the consecrated seculars, that this will happen. And in the countries in, Latin, in um, Africa, we have three countries there where we are present, there we still have many vocations coming. But they also feel the importance of having associates who help us to live our charism in a wider area than just in the, in the community, for example, in our ministries, but in their own families. They continue our charism to bring this tender love of our God. If you think of a bubble and how it's created, you, you put the wand in and you blow, but you have to blow gently or else the bubble, it breaks. So when you blow gently, for me, it's like the breath of the Holy Spirit giving life. And this bubble floats in the air, and as the sun strikes it, it becomes multicolored, just like the multicultural piece of, our, of, of who we are in this world. And, and as it floats, it gives de absolute delight. You can't help but think of our God. And then when it breaks, it's not sadness, because when it breaks, it becomes part of earth again, and it recycles. And that's why I love bubbles. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so glad. <laughs> <laughs>